Hello everyone, my name is Ashwin Seshia. I'm an academic at the University of Cambridge, and uh, we are going to talk about MEMS inertial sensors in the next couple of hours or so. As we go through these slides, feel free to, to stop me at any time if you've got any questions. So, really, the, the topic can be covered, uh, you know, in a semester-long course. And uh, really, what I'm going to do here is, is focus in on the areas of overlap with, um, with the interests of this community. So the, the, the overlap in particularly transduction principles and measurement techniques that uh, are directly relevant to, to uh, uh, the topic of this conference. Uh, but to set the scene, I'd like to uh, start out by looking at the field more broadly, looking at some of the applications for uh, MEMS inertial sensors today, the requirements for, uh, for looking at uh, applications that demand higher performance and where some of the, the techniques being developed in, in this community might, might be relevant for those sorts of applications. So start off with a bit of sort of background and motivation, talk a little bit about uh, existing technology and limitations associated with, with existing technologies, and then uh, get into the two classes of sensors uh, that'll be the, the main focus for this tutorial. Uh, so resonant techniques essentially uh, as defined in the most broadest sense, is applied to, to inertial uh, sensors. We look at accelerometers, and there are a couple of subclasses that I'll cover in detail. Um, and some of the issues around fabrication and packaging. And uh, then we get into the gyroscopes. Again, look at the different types of gyroscopes, and again, uh, end with frequency output gyros that again have a uh, very direct uh, connectivity with, with the topics of this conference, but of course, uh, gyros, most gyros are resonant devices. And then look at, you know, as we push into higher performance applications, what sorts of applications could be enabled uh, with, with some of the techniques that I'm describing here that aren't possible with, with other more conventional techniques. Okay, so, uh, MEMS inertial sensors really, you know, even though the field is just over a couple of decades old, um, have already found application in a wide variety of different uh, systems and ranging from automotive, perhaps the initial focus, uh, so a number of uh, applications there from airbag deployment to, to smart braking, suspension, active suspensions, rollover detection, anti-braking anti systems, so on and so forth, to platform stabilization applications in a variety of, again, both terms of electronics and larger scale uh, user interfaces, so MEMS inertial sensors are built into pretty much every smartphone, and even in, in some of the other applications that are less well known, for example, seismic imaging for the oil and gas industry, MEMS accelerometers are now displacing the more traditional geophones um, because of some of the advantages uh, with the uh, improved DC performance and in certain cases, better, better dynamic range and, and uh, bandwidth. There are, there are emerging applications as well, uh, and some of this, these are also captured in this slide here. I'll, I'll touch upon some of the ones that are relevant to to some of the techniques that I'll, I'll describe later on as well. But of course, there's, there's a lot of talk of driverless cars and uh, the navigation systems for driverless cars, part of which will possibly be a MEMS-based uh, solution. Uh, GPS backup in a variety of scenarios, you're already uh, potentially uh, used in smartphones where using the built-in inertial sensors can lower the, the overall power budget 
for, for indoor navigation. And perhaps initially it might start out by combining a number of sensor types, um, including magnetic field sensors, inertial sensors, altimeters, um, and uh, uh, perhaps also using RF ranging and so forth. But ultimately there is, there is uh, really interest in whether you can, you can come up with uh, inertial sensors uh, with, with sufficient accuracy for, for indoor navigation type ap applications. There are all sorts of interesting applications uh, here. So the, the field, the applications field is, is now really broad and, and far beyond what was originally envisaged when, when MEMS technology got applied to, to, uh, to the construction of the first inertial sensors. Okay, so to look at some of the, you know, so, so inertial sensors, I guess the uh, initial idea was actually to replace these, these much larger scale macroscopic systems. And those systems were traditionally, particularly gyros, were used for inertial navigation. And MEMS devices, of course, have not, have not reached uh, sufficient accuracy to meet uh, navigation grade standards. And we'll, we'll try and look at, at why why that is with, with a couple of, uh, of uh, slides in background. So a uh, schematic of a MEMS inertial measurement unit would possibly be uh, captured with this sort of schematic level diagram. So you've got the three axis acceleration sensors, three axis uh, rate gyros, and then possibly a temperature sensor to to account for temperature effects. And then you've got um, your navigation algorithm that, that uses the, the, uh, the, the uh, data from these sensors to compute position essentially as a state estimation problem. And so, so there, is, there is in fact uh, a significant level of calibration and uh, then filtering of the, of the raw data that, that happens within, the, within that microcontroller. But the, uh, the parameters of these, of these sensors uh, are relevant in terms of the, the extent to which you can, you can accurately define position as a function of time. And we look at how, how, what, what, what those key parameters are and how they relate to uh, uh, to this, this sort of problem. So, so the navigation problem, we took, take, like to look at uh, strapped down navigation systems. Uh, the rate gyro signals are integrated to give you a whole angle. And that, that information is then fed into a um, computation of the, of the, essentially the accelerations in the, uh, uh, in, a, in the stationary frame. That's then uh, corrected for gravity and then double integrated to give you position. So when you're looking at, uh, at translating these outputs, so, so for example, if you had uh, navigation, the navigation problem in a two dimensional space, you would have uh, three sensors there you've got three degrees of uh, freedom that you've got to account for, so rotation about the z-axis and then the two translational axes. And in this case, uh, this, is, this is useful just to, to illustrate how these, these errors accumulate when you, when you look at position estimation. Uh, so, so let's uh, take the case that you've got rotation about this axis and uh, translation about, about one of these axes, and you want to then uh, calculate the, uh, the position with respect to your, uh, your uh, fixed frame of reference. Uh, so you then project the acceleration vectors onto, the, onto that, uh, uh, from the body frame onto the, to the uh, navigation frame, and that's done through this, this angle that's de determined by the, the gyro output. So, so then your your acceleration quantities when written in the, uh, uh, in, the, in the navigation reference frame would, would be related through the angle. And so 
When we look at uh, this angle, say, let's say, ramping up as a constant function of time, for instance, to a, a term that we'll call the bias, um, what, what, we can, what we essentially see is that uh, uh, if you take very small, infinitesimal uh, integration times such that, that that angle theta is, uh, uh, is or sine theta is approximately equal to theta, these, those position uh, values can be integrated uh, from the, the acceleration data and they, they essentially result when you, when you integrate once to get your velocity, integrate as a, a square of time and integrate twice to give you position, they accumulate even more as a cubed of time. So, so each time you run through that integration, this, this, this term, this bias term, which essentially is uh, um, in, in gyros a uh, key figure of merit, the, uh, the output of the gyro in the absence of a rotation rate uh, that can't be accounted for, for by, by, by calibration results in the accumulation of these, uh, of, uh, of position errors uh, very significantly in this very simple-minded analysis as a cubed, uh, cubed of time. And that's one of the reasons for, uh, for, uh, for significant error buildups due to the biases associated with the rate gyros. You look at uh, accelerometer bias and position error, it turns out that that is, uh, it's less sensitive. Uh, so we could go through that same analysis or a similar analysis. Uh, as you're integrating, double integrating, you have a, a quadratic function of time there. And so the, the bias errors in an, in an accelerometer are less significant in, in, an, in a navigation context than, than for a gyro. So, so you can take then consumer grade uh, gyros or uh, uh, specifications for MEMS devices that might be typically built into to smartphones and see how these errors build up in time. And let's take the problem where you essentially are just standing stationary in a building and you're looking at how the, uh, the algorithm estimates how the, uh, where, where it thinks you are in the building just by integrating the, 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 the outputs from the accelerometer and the, and the gyro. And because of the, of the primarily the, the gyro bias term, so what's plotted is, is the sum of the two, uh, all of the noise sources in, in red. This is just a simulation based on, on the, uh, the specifications for accelerometers and gyros you can get off data sheets. The, uh, the position error builds up very significantly in a function of time. So in a time period of 100 seconds or so, uh, you're significantly off from, um, from where you would, you, would, you would be. And most of that is determined by the gyro noise uh, for typical off-the-shelf uh, sensors, not surprisingly, just based through that uh, analysis that we just looked at, those, those errors build up faster as a function of time. And this is a logarithmic scale, so, so the, the differences accumulate very quickly uh, over time. Uh, but you could do this, you could work through this for different navigation problems, um, and this, is, this really sets the basis for why, why these metrics, such as bias stability, uh, for the gyro in particular, is an important metric for, for inertial navigation systems. So this, this table here um, sort of lists uh, some of the sorts of uh, ranges uh, for, for gyros. And we'll, you know, throughout this, this tutorial, I'll put up uh, charts for, for um, the uh, measured uh, noise performance for, for MEMS gyros and accelerometers so that you can relate it back to these specifications. Really, the specifications for inertial navigation are quite demanding, and uh, at the macroscopic scale, as presented in the previous tutorial are typically met by ring laser gyros or, or macroscopic precision machined uh, mechanical gyros. Um, so examples of, the, uh, of these performance specifications for navigation grade gyros, these are macroscopic gyros. Uh, this is a particular macroscopic gyro from Honeywell. 
Um, and uh, you can see here that uh, you've got um, a bias stability that's well below uh, 10 to the minus two degrees per hour um, for, these, for these gyros uh, to meet that, meet that navigation specification. For the, for accelerometers, uh, this is a, this is far more relaxed. So that's, that's in units of meters per second per hour. So that would translate that to about 10 micro G or so. Uh, for those of you more familiar with, um, with units in, in, in Gs. Um, so that, that typically is, is met by capacitive uh, MEMS accelerometers. Okay, so, so let's look at capacitive MEMS accelerometers. In fact, there's, there's been, this is really to set the context for why you might want to look at resonant techniques. Um, and these, this is really the most common approach to, uh, to acceleration measurement. Um, there are a number of other transduction principles that can be applied at the MEMS scale. All of them have been applied uh, to, you know, capacitive is most common, uh, a number of reasons, uh, starting out just primarily being the you know, simplicity of uh, integration and fabrication, as well as sufficient um, accuracy that can be built in by integrating the circuits closely with the, with the MEM structures. Uh, but at pushing at the higher accuracy end, uh, you know, both capacitive and optical techniques uh, get fairly close, close to the, the thermal mechanical noise flows. The, uh, the, the sort of principle, of course, uh, works as shown here, is you've got uh, proof mass supported by flexures under an acceleration field. You have a displacement that you measure uh, with respect to a set of fixed electrodes that are supported off the substrate, and uh, the change in capacitance is then proportional to the, to the changing displacement, which in turn is proportional by by Hooke's uh, law to first order to, to the acceleration. So there is a uh, relationship. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll get into, so, so this doesn't actually capture any of the noise sources yet, or the, yes, it's just the, uh, Yeah, so there are, there is a subtlety. Uh, the fundamental limits ultimately in terms of position measurement or force measurement are the same, but there are practical considerations that go, go along with each of those, uh, which mean that the actual measured performance is different. And that, that's, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so essentially uh, the, uh, uh, Capacitive, or dis essentially displacement measurement principles, um, go with uh, a fundamental scaling law go that goes with the inverse square of the natural frequency. So, if you build higher sensitivity devices, you you typically scale the natural frequency, um, and and in the MEMS context, that that's difficult to do because of the uh, the scaling and natural frequency goes counter to miniaturization. So, so. Uh, the lowest natural frequencies um, are typically just below 10 hertz, and it, it does take a fairly large device to achieve that. The, uh, of course, that's, that's just, that's, sensitivity is, is simply just one metric. Fund the fundamental limits to measurement are determined by thermal mechanical noise in the system, and uh, uh, by creating the, the Brownian uh, noise um, uh, force generator uh, to, to the uh, magnitude of the inertial force. You can come up with an expression there that, that, that sets that limit. Um, and that, that limit, as you can see, goes as an inverse square root of the mass and the quality factor of the system. So large mass systems, again, counter to miniaturization um, is, uh, it's beneficial, that's why some of the most sensitive devices are, are actually fairly large. In the MEMS context, they're typically about a centimeter or so on the side, and uh, the Q factors um, might be hundreds or a few thousands, depending on the, on the packaging scheme that's used. 
Thermal mechanical noise, I think it's not familiar to um, everybody in this audience. Um, as a re review, essentially, you've got this uh, thermodynamic equilibrium between the, the, the micro-machine mass and uh, the surrounding thermal bath, and that's captured by this uh, the, the fluctuation dissipation theorem. But this essentially means that this dashboard is exchanging energy in, in both directions. It's not just a dissipative element, it's also an element that allows the system to preserve thermodynamic equilibrium. And that results in a fluctuating um, uh, displacement of the mass that can be modeled uh, by that uh, force generator um, that's related to the damping constant that's shown there. So that, that essentially is, is what sets the fundamental limit. But of course, there are practical limits associated then with the, with the measurement schemes and the construction principles applied that uh, involve other noise sources and other sources of drift that uh, ultimately limit the measurement. So this, this is perhaps uh, the, the best published result for a MEMS accelerometer. This is from Tom Pike's group at Imperial. And uh, this, this is a noise flow that's about four nanog per root hertz. It's measuring the, uh, the, uh, 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 the microseismic peak um, uh, just due to it, the ambient uh, seismic noise. Um, so um, you've got that that here, but the the noise noise of the, the sensor itself is down um, uh, beyond a 25 second corner at about four nanog per root hertz. But as you can see, at the the longer periods, there is even though the this is probably um, uh, a very significantly optimized result with low noise board level electronics where the, where the one over F noise corner of the associated electronics is particularly minimized to a number of techniques, you still have a, uh, a noise roll off. Uh, and so getting down to the, the long period measurements is, is difficult. Um, so these, this is, these are really examples of one off devices. The commercial grade, uh, the best seismic grade accelerometers typically have a, have a noise corner that rolls off uh, you know, around 10 hertz or so, so well up on this chart, and then get, get into a, uh, a noise performance that's sort of around 10 nanog per root hertz over the range between about 10 hertz to 200 hundreds of hertz or so. So that's, that's typical of the, of the best capacitive MEMS accelerometers, and so some of the issues here are the are the issues around um, the inability to do uh, accurate low frequency uh, long period measurements, the, the associated issues when typically these, these, these sensors um, are, uh, have to be uh, vacuum encapsulated and uh, to, to reduce the Brownian noise as well. And that, of course, then also has, a, has associated limitations in, in uh, uh, bandwidth uh, and response times. It, uh, uh, there are also, so, you know, typically these are servo systems, feedback systems, and uh, where, where essentially the proof mass is kept nominally stationary through a, a force feedback scheme. And there is a limitation in the, in the dynamic range of these sorts of sensors, which is um, limited both by the nonlinearity of the transduction um, associated with with these sorts of uh, sensing principles if, to, to, to allow you to get the sensitivity and uh, the, the extent, the dynamic range associated with the feedback scheme. So that typically limits the dynamic range even at the upper end to about 120 dB or so. But that, that's nevertheless a very impressive result. Uh, you know, and so capacitive techniques do, do uh, you know, access a number of uh, applications and certainly are good enough. Uh, as far as noise performance goes to meet, uh, uh, in, you know, pedestrian navigation type applications. And they're also, they can also be miniaturized very considerably. So this is the latest uh, generation of um, inertial sensor technology uh, of a whole range of technologies that uh, allows these MEM structures to be built right on top of um, standard CMOS. So you start off with a standard CMOS wafer, you've got a MEMS wafer that's essentially bonded to the surface of the CMOS, 
and then the processing is done on the on the MEMS layer. Um, so this can be done through deep RIE, but the key key issue here is because um, there is no pre-patterning of the MEMS structure, the alignment um, is defi defined by, by lithography on the MEMS die. That can be um, very accurate rather than, than, than wafer bond alignment. And then the whole, whole uh, device again uh, is vacuum encapsulated at a wafer level. Uh, so these are now all, all uh, or, or encapsulated in a hermetic environment. So these, this, this allows you to build these MEM structures right on top of CMOS die, and that allows miniaturization down to sizes about a, a square millimeter. So these, these die now that are in the smartphone are extremely tiny down, down, down in the sort of uh, uh, one square millimeter or so. Okay, so, so capacitive techniques are are pretty good, so they do uh, meet uh, uh, you know, a lot of the lot of the emerging application requirements as well. Uh, but I, you know, there are reasons uh, captured in, in some of these slides. Uh, for example, the the issues with the low frequency measurements, um, the issues with limited dynamic range, as I said, and so forth, uh, and the fact that of course the technique fundamentally doesn't scale with miniaturization. So Fundamentally, the technique does rely on um, uh, a sensitivity that goes as inverse square of the natural frequency that runs counter to miniaturization. So the, the highest accuracy devices are still fairly large. And that, that uh, uh, is sort of a motivation to start looking at al alternative techniques and resonant accelerometers and our example where, where, you, where an alternative transduction technique, in fact, um, helps address some of these, these issues. So to start out, uh, let's look at the two uh, most commonly used accelerometer topologies. Um, so again, spring-supported proof mass, but instead of typically, um, there, are, there are two approaches you can use. You can use a displacement sensing approach, just as for capacitive or optical sensing techniques, and in this case, um, what, what you have is a, uh, a vibrating beam of some sort uh, that's driven into resonance, uh, perhaps using a uh, feedback scheme. Um, so this is built into an, an oscillator configuration. Um, and the resonant frequency is, is changed as the gap between the, the vibrating beam and a set of electrodes attached to the mass changes. Um, and there is, uh, that's, that's just due to the the electrostatic spring softening effect. Now that, that turns out to be a nonlinear function of gap. So while you could get quite uh, good sensitivities, uh, that these, these are, uh, uh, apart from the uh, small variations of gap, fairly nonlinear with gap, uh, they, they are significantly gap dependent, so they can be dependent on edge tolerances associated with creating very small gaps. And uh, they have limited dynamic range because of that limitation of nonlinearity. So typically, would have to be operated in some sort of force feedback configuration. Uh, you might might uh, try and uh, 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 try to improve that uh, dynamic range somewhat, uh, maybe by say pre-biasing the mass at at uh, at a particular value, for instance, and just looking at small deviations about that value. Uh, there is an alternate technique that's based on force measurement. So instead of uh, letting the proof mass displace, you measure the inertial force um, through a uh, through an arrangement where that 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 that, 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 that inertial force couples in as a modulation of the stiffness of a, of a vibrating beam. Again, that's built into an oscillator configuration, so that the uh, uh, output frequency of the oscillator tracks the resonant frequency of the beam, and that uh, then is a function of the, of that, of the inertial force. And it turns out that this, this technique actually scales well with uh, miniaturization, both in terms of sensitivity, but also provides you uh, a high dynamic range, um, a very good scale factor linearity over that dynamic range, and, um, 
a sensitivity that actually doesn't run counter to miniaturization, so that, that actually improves with, with the miniaturization of the beams. Um, now the overall system might look something like this, so you typically have a, a differential configuration of some sort to reject temperature effects, so you have um, that sensor oscillator and uh, that might be here that responds to that resonant frequency shift and then a uh, either reference or, or a, or a, or a uh, resonator is placed on the opposite side of the mass to give you a differential measurement of acceleration um, and then you measure that difference frequency and, uh, and that then, that, that frequency, um, that different frequency then can measure by any number of counting techniques and I've, I've attached a few slides in your pack to go through some of the counting techniques that may be applicable both for low bandwidth uh, measurements and sort of high, higher bandwidth measurements. So the noise modeling of these sorts of devices is very similar to the, essentially it's, it's, it's uh, the same as uh, noise modeling in, a, uh, in an oscillator uh, incorporating a MEMS resonator. But in this case, of course, the output frequency is a function of um, acceleration or, or rotation. Uh, but essentially, uh, the formulation of uh, frequency noise is uh, related to those those noise sources in that in the feedback loop, including the thermomechanical noise of the of the vibrating element and any any other noise that's injected uh, by the electronics. So either the phase phase noise spectrum or the or the frequency noise. Uh, spectrum would capture the, uh, the the noise behavior of such a such a device. There is, of course, another noise source that that is the, the noise generator due to that uh, that that proof mass, the inertial mass. So, it's given that these are uh, oscillators, you could also look at Allen variance measurements, look at uh, output stability over time, and that's that's an alternative technique to to characterize the, the behavior of these devices. So again, these devices have uh, been in the research domain um, for quite a while, but there are, there are a couple of technology reasons that mean that uh, uh, these are gonna be more accessible for wider application. Uh, one has to do with, with uh, vacuum encapsulation at the wafer level, so all of the techniques developed for MEMS clocks can be applied uh, in terms of packaging for these sorts of devices as well, um, with some caveats because these are typically larger area devices. Uh, so one of those schemes goes, relies on bonded wafer processing. Uh, so for instance, this could be using uh, uh, eutectic bonding, for instance, uh, under a, a vacuum environment, and you can get uh, wafer level uh, vacuum encapsulated devices with uh, uh, beam Q factors that go well beyond tens of thousands using such approaches. So this is, uh, so there's the, the wafer bonding approach, there is the thin film encapsulation approach, for example, for example, the cytine resonators uh, would be encapsulated in this format. Um, and so, so the ability to do wafer level vacuum packaging uh, allows for a, for a stable ambient uh, for these types of sensors and mitigates a lot of the issues around drift, allowing for higher Q factor operation um, uh, without resulting um, in, in, um, in, in say, more bespoke uh, packaging needs these sensors as well. The other issue traditionally with these sensors is temperature stability. So again, um, all of the uh, engineering approaches to engineer um, stable silicon references could be applied to these sensors that includes degenerate doping or including uh, looking at composite uh, material approaches uh, where you're compensating for the, uh, for the variations in temperature of uh, the uh, modulus of silicon. And so the, these can now bring um, the stabilities for silicon devices um, in, in com 
comparable to quartz, and that also then, uh, in a, then it, when you add to that, organization techniques could uh, bring the stabilities uh, down to, to levels that, that, uh, um, that allow for those, those high, um, high period measurements. So this, this chart again uh, applies equally to, uh, apart from the, the, the uh, frequency synthesis approach would apply to, uh, to those, uh, to these resonance sensors as well in terms of uh, being able to, to tune the uh, temperature sensitivities um, of, of these devices um, at a uh, material processing um, device and circuit level, and, and then using organization techniques. Okay, so, so those can now be applied to, to uh, uh, MEMS accelerometers, and this slide now captures uh, a schematic of, a, of one of these, one of the, the approaches to build a resonant accelerometer uh, using these vibrating beam elements on, on, that are placed on either side of, the, of, a, of a proof mass. They're connected through this, through this proof mass that's suspended off the substrate through, through a force amplification mechanism. And so when you, one of, one of the common ways to test these devices is in fact to test them under a gravity field where you simply, these are single axis devices, you tilt the devices relative to the gravity field that, that varies the inertial loading on the device and you've got a push-pull type uh, configuration here so that one of these beams is subject to tensile loading, the other to compressive loading and so you've got a uh, uh, frequency increase and a frequency decrease that's measured off these, these two um, oppositely placed vibrating beam elements that um, then is proportional to the measured acceleration. Okay, so, let's see. So to, to uh, get into some of the details of the mechanics, uh, let's divide the, uh, divide the, the functional elements of this up uh, so you've got a suspended proof mass, a lever, lever mechanism, and then these vibrating beam elements that are used for detection. The, the equation of the motion for the vibrating beam um, can be written here as follows in, in, in terms of a generalized mode co modal coordinate. And this would capture, for instance, the effect of an attached electrode to the, the vibrating beam to be able to do the detection. Um, and the, the resonant frequency of the, of the vibrating beams uh, can then be uh, determined by writing out the expression for the effective mass and the effective stiffness as a function of the, of the mode shape and then the beam geometries. So once you have an expression for the uh, resonant frequency, the scale factor here is defined as the, the gradient of that resonant frequency with respect to um, an inertial force. Um, and in this case, this is, this is simply uh, the simplest form of force sensor that, that's, that's uh, being applied to the measurement of, um, uh, of acceleration. And you can then come up with an expression for that, for that scale factor, for that resonator scale factor. And if you work it out for the fundamental mode of the beam, um, then you can simplify that expression to, to uh, capture uh, material parameters and beam geometries. And uh, the end result here is that you have a, a scale factor that is, that is a function of um, beam geometries in this form. So th these are, essentially the length of the time, the width of the time, the thickness, and then the area of any electrodes that are attached. And if you were to look at uh, the, um, the case where, let's say there is no attached mass uh, to, to, uh, for driving, so that these maybe are just sandwiched with respect to a parallel plate electrode, 
then so first of all, there, there is no dependence on the, the length. <coughs> there is a very significant dependence on the, on the, on the width of the beams, that those are an inverse square of the beams and the thickness. And if you uh, were to then look at um, uh, this, essentially uh, just look at the frequency shift as your output, um, with respect to an inertial force, if you were to scale all the dimensions uniformly for, for a device of this sort, uh, then the, uh, the dependence with respect to geometry is scale invariant in a very simplistic sense. So if you were to scale the, all the dimensions, so the proof mass and the, the, the widths of these, of these uh, vibrating beams, you have a scale invariant. So that's, that is then very different to that of the capacitive sensing technique where you have an inverse square of the natural frequency with, as, as, uh, as your scale factor. The, uh, the, the inertial force can be amplified prior to detection. And what this allows you to do is, if you're, for instance, limited by the, by the noise of the detect, detector element, that is the vibrating beam itself, uh, you can amplify the inertial force using a force leverage mechanism to, uh, to get, get you some additional margin with respect to signal to noise. And uh, that this, these levers work uh, very similar at the, at the MEM scale as at the macroscopic scale. Uh, with caveats in that you, can, you can't build perfect pivots or joints, so there is always some energy loss associated with those types of implementations. Um, there is a theoretical maximum in terms of the effective amplification. Uh, so this is the effective amplification of the lever scheme, which is essentially the, the force that's experienced on the resonator, uh, shown here, with respect to the force that's, uh, that's acting on the proof mass, which is simply the mass times the acceleration. And so this, this effective amp, uh, Amplification factor is, is a function of the um, uh, of the uh, stiffnesses of these uh, uh, the axial stiffness of this, this vibrating beam and uh, the um, the suspension stiffness of the proof mass because because you've got a trade off in terms of uh, uh, how the uh, the energy uh, associated with the uh, deflection of the mass is partly then compensated through the deflection of the, of the uh, uh, leverage mechanism as a whole. And uh, so, so there, is, there is a theoretical maximum there. Uh, but but uh, in practical implementations, you typically see uh, in most MEMS processes about an amplification of somewhere between a factor of 10 to, to 100 or so. Um, so this is, for instance, a, one of the simple schemes that you can apply. That's, that's the vibrating beam there. That's, that's a lever mechanism. And uh, you can uh, typically, there is the uh, first order analytical model, but you would, you would typically rely on parameterized numerical models to, uh, to optimize these, uh, these particular geometries. And so this, this plot here captures the uh, relationship between frequency shift on that axis and um, axial force on this axis, including some of the nonlinear effects um, associated with the uh, with the, uh, the beam mechanics. So, for small loading, you've got nearly linear behavior, uh, but at larger loading, you've got either uh, softening effects or uh, Ultimately, in, other, in compression buckling of these beams, that that's essentially sets a, a failure mechanism for the, for the beams and an, up, an upper bound for their operational limit. So this, this, this limit here in the MEMS context, that's about 2,000 micronewtons, which turns out to be fairly large for these types of beams. Of course, that can be tuned by using the beam width. So for narrower beams that you would expect, they buckle earlier as compared to the, the wider beams. Um, 
So again, this is, this is where a trade-off between sensitivity and dynamic range uh, comes in for these sorts of, uh, comes with sorts of devices. Okay, but uh, again, uh, you can get uh, uh, devices that uh, uh, go up to the dynamic range of plus or minus one G and uh, uh, get down to a noise flow that's significantly lower um, well, close, close to uh, limits in the nano G per root hertz regime uh, using this approach. And this is an example for one of our devices that was fabricated probably four or five years ago, where this is, again, a single access device mounted on a tilt table, and we, we subjected gravitational loading. You can see for small tilt angles, we've got a linear response, but of course, um, you will trace out a sine function um, over the entire dynamic range um, as um, you, you uh, vary the tilt over larger angles. And uh, so this, this would track the entire plus or minus uh, 1G range with a linearity of uh, better than 1%. Um, this is a comparison of the uh, MEMS device uh, in, a, in the context of a seismic application. So it's uh, responsive, can be made responsive to uh, dynamic loading as well by, by tuning the, uh, uh, the, the uh, bandwidth, or the mechanical bandwidth and the quality factor. And uh, so uh, this is, this is a, one of the industry standard seismometers um, versus a resonant MEMS accelerometer. Um, and these are fairly low frequency measurements that are done, uh, so a few hertz um, in time series. This is a uh, inferred uh, uh, noise uh, spectrum for the for those devices. What you can see here, uh, with a little very very significant optimization, is a noise corner that's around 20 millihertz. So that. Uh, is one of the fundamental advantages of the resin technique versus the capacitor technique uh, is, is this uh, ability to, to have these very low noise corners but it, because in, in, in a sense the, the, uh, the detection is actually done at the resonant frequency of the beams which is at hundreds of kilohertz potentially well above the noise corner of the associated electronics. So the only way that uh, you know, you've got this low frequency roll off that is primarily mediated by nonlinear effects interacting with the, with noise processes and uh, drift mechanism that, that are present in these, these sorts of systems. So, so that uh, mechanical chopping, if you will, of that, of the, um, of the signals to the higher frequencies of measurement allows for these, uh, these low, lower frequency, uh, higher, higher period measurements. So what, again, limits the um, stability of these devices? The issues around these are similar to the issues around the, um, the limits to stability of MEMS oscillators. And I said the, uh, if you didn't have nonlinear effects or drift, drift mechanisms, then you could, you could measure uh, to very, Long, long periods, very low frequencies. Uh, so, so inherently, the um, issues around frequency stability must in account for nonlinear effects, um, both nonlinear effects in the in the beam mechanics, and then in the uh, associated circuitry, and that the interaction of that those nonlinearities with noise processes in the loop. So, uh, to do this, uh, you could do this, of course, numerically. Uh, but to have a more general scalable model, uh, we've looked at combining analytical uh, and numerical approaches to, to allow us to get some insight into that interaction. So uh, models such as the equivalent of a uh, uh, classical van der Paul oscillator, but for the MEMS context that, are, that in integrate essential beam nonlinearities uh, can then be constructed. Then you look at noise driven uh, behavior of such such oscillators, and under certain assumptions, uh, 
a certain noise source is being out those form expressions. In other cases, in a more generalized case, that, that would be subject to numerical simulation. And uh, so in a MEMS context, nonlinearities are actually quite common and visible and can be, can be uh, um, as, as well known in this community, can be very significant in determining frequency stability. So this is a measured response of a MEMS resonator, one of these tuning fork type detectors. It's been subject to uh, drive levels of increasing amplitude. And you can see this uh, classic duffing type response. And in this case, it's a stiffening effect um, uh, that can be captured by, by one of those models. And uh, because of the, the low damping conditions, in fact, these, these can go show, exhibit uh, fairly significant hysteresis in the response. Uh, one of the issues, of course, is, is um, of course, a linear model would predict improving frequency stability as the amplitude increases, um, while nonlinear effects, of course, then would uh, combine to uh, put, a, put a limit to the, uh, to the operating amplitude, because at some point, the, the detrimental effects of nonlinear noise of conversion uh, start to kick in, and that's what's captured in these phase noise plots. So, Again, that's done for those increasing drive amplitudes as you go from drive amplitudes of 16 millivolts up to 160 millivolts. And the phase noise of the uh, oscillator initially improves and then uh, degrades, particularly the near carrier noise, uh, which, is, which is relevant for low frequency long period measurement. Okay, so those were models. And then going on to experimental data, um, so we, we did some experiments on a uh, an oscillator, uh, with a board level oscillator with a MEMS resonator. It's very much a tuning fork element that would be used in an accelerometer context. And these are the measured open loop responses of the uh, uh, of the resonator. You can see this very significant uh, nonlinearity at low pressure levels. As you change the uh, pressure conditions, you can, um, you can come back to a nearly linear response um, and then, then to, a, to a linear response at, uh, under uh, high damping conditions. So here, the, the, not, the degree of nonlinearity was, uh, uh, was varied by changing the uh, damping conditions while keeping the feedback voltage constant. And these are the, the measured uh, uh, results, the Allen deviation of, the, of that MEMS oscillator. And what you see here is a, uh, at the low and high damping conditions, those, those are these two uh, figures, uh, these two cases here. This is an effective damping um, constant, if you will. Those are the worst cases of frequency stability. And um, as you change the damping conditions, there is an intermediate point where you get um, the best case for frequency stability here, um, consistent with the general qualitative predictions from that, from that model. So one way of, therefore, controlling um, the uh, Controlling this effect could be to, to control the packaging uh, process to, to, in fact, uh, regulate the pressure level in the package. Um, you would also uh, have a set point for the oscillator in terms of an amplitude, desired amplitude set point, or a, uh, uh, a desired uh, um, set point in terms of some of the other parameters that can be varied. Of course, some of these do have, have other effects as well. For example, the bias voltage. Uh, nevertheless, you can use this to optimize the, uh, the noise spectrum of the oscillator. So this was work at, at transducers last year, where, again, in the linear case, you can get this, um, this noise flow that's nearly white down to the very low noise corners. Uh, but then as you increase the drive amplitude, you have this nonlinear noise up conversion. 
you do have improvement in the fat fall carrier uh, noise though, so at those um, um, higher, higher frequencies, the uh, noise flow in this case is uh, about 70 nano G per third. Okay, so that was the case of, uh, of devices based on, um, based on force measurement. Look at uh, devices based on changes in electrostatic stiffness. And this is, there are a number of other, number of papers here. It's, it's not uh, possible to, to list all of the uh, publications in the literature that uh, use this concept. And again, uh, the previous publication was just one example of, of a number in the literature. Um, the, um, the case here is uh, essentially an implementation which, where you've got uh, essentially two tuning fork type oscillators that are driven in the, in the tuning fork mode. And you've got a set of uh, fixed stationary electrodes that uh, uh, interact with a set of electrodes on these masses. <clears throat> so that in a displacement sensing context, you have a, a change in electrostatic stiffness that can be picked up um, as the uh, change in resonant frequencies of these, of these oscillators. So the mechanical uh, resonance is modulated by this electrostatic stiffness term. You can see that, that um, this is fairly nonlinear both in, in uh, gap and in um, the applied voltage and, and in, in acceleration, but for small uh, variations in electrostatic stiffness with, with respect to the mechanical stiffness, you can linearize this expression and uh, uh, work, work through a, uh, a nearly, nearly linearized model for frequency shift as a function of uh, acceleration, which is what, what's done here. Um, the idea of the differential measurement scheme here, because as you can see, uh, what's cleverly done is that one set of capacitors on one of these oscillators will involve an increasing gap while the other will involve a decreasing gap. So you've got a stiffness direction that would go uh, in the opposite sense for resonator one as to resonator two, uh, while common mode effects like temperature would go in the same direction. So a so differential uh, readout builds in a level of temperature immunity. So that's uh, the, uh, the uh, implementation here for this, this uh, particular device. There are often tuning electrodes for these devices. The, the idea is to maybe bias them to a nominal operating point. For example, uh, under a 1G load, you might uh, bias them to an operating point uh, 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 and uh, and look at, at deviations about that, that operating point. So, um, so this is again measured results. And what, what, what is in interesting is because of that differential measurement, um, there is very good scale factor immunity to temperature shifts. So in this, this implementation, uh, with measurements done at two different temperatures, the response curves align uh, uh, fairly well. As you can see, even though there is a uh, drift in the absolute frequencies. And uh, this is, these are the Allen deviation results. So again, the differential measurements show improved stability over time, primarily because of that ability to compensate for temperature effects. Um, and, uh, and so again, when, if you're looking at for bias stability as a metric uh, for accelerometers as well, the resonant uh, techniques uh, tend to provide improved bias stability as compared to the capacitor techniques. Okay, but, but in, the, in the broadest sense, in fact, uh, uh, you know, the techniques I've described are, are a subclass, and there is a fairly wide range of resonant phenomena uh, that can be applied to, uh, uh, to to sensing that's not just simply re restricted to resonant frequency shifts of one or two uncoupled beam elements. Uh, and in fact, by looking at uh, coupled systems, there are 
complementary modalities for readout that, that allow for potentially higher sensitivities as well as uh, improved immunity to drift. So one such example is what we've called more localized sensing, which relies on tracking um, eigenstate variations in a, in a system of weakly coupled resonators. And so the analogy is that to coupled pendula, where you have um, symmetric systems in a coupled pendula where the eigenstates would be perfectly symmetric. So um, you would have the in-phase and the out-of-phase mode, um, which would be perfectly symmetric. But when, these, when you've got structural perturbations in the system, for instance, by changing the length of one of the, uh, you have a significant uh, uh, perturbation in, in the eigenstates. So they, they're no longer symmetric, but reflect that, that structural perturbation. And it turns out that this effect is uh, the, the fractional change in, in, in uh, the variations in eigenstates are much more sensitive to changes in, in resonant frequency. Uh, but because these, these effects are only uh, defined by symmetry breaking perturbations, you've got effects like temperature that impact on each of these resonators identically, uh, that does not result in symmetry breaking and therefore the eigenstates in that, in that case are still symmetric. So, so if, you, if you were just measuring the effects of temperature to first order in an uncompensated system, the eigenstates would not change, they would still be symmetric and therefore you would not record a, uh, a, a change in, in, uh, in response. And that, that in fact is uh, what you often want in a sensor context where you want immunity to common mode effects, passive immunity to common mode effects, um, while allowing for highly sensitive uh, measurements of a differential effect. This is reflected here in, in the measurements um, in, in a system of uh, coupled tuning fork resonators. You're changing the temperature over a wide range and then pressure over two orders of magnitude. And uh, there is, uh, in an uncompensated system, very small relative changes in eigenstate. So these could be applied to both displacement sensing or force sensing uh, cases. So that's an example of displacement sensing and then an example of force sensing. Uh, but instead of using a single vibrating beam element, you have now an addition of a second beam element and in these, these sorts of systems, you can, you can record both resonant frequency shifts and eigenstate variations, with the eigenstate variations providing you potential for higher sensitivity, lower dynamic range measurements with uh, improved uh, long-term stability. So if you look at uh, the, uh, uh, the simplest model that describes the system is essentially a uh, a couple two degree of freedom mass spring dashboard system uh, with weak uh, mechanical coupling. And we can, uh, under the low damping conditions, come up with those form expressions for the resonant frequencies and the eigenstates and so forth. Uh, and it turns out that the eigenstate variation can be reflected as a change, for example, if you've got a change of stiffness, it is linearly proportional to that structural perturbation and stiffness divided by the, the uh, uh, strength of the coupling constant, or the coupling constant. And so if you, if you look at weak coupling, um, or in fact electrostatic coupling, you can get um, very significant uh, fractional uh, responses in eigenstate. Um, and with electrostatic coupling, that could be made tunable as well. If you look at thermomechanical noise limits, it turns out that the, that the, uh, the noise flow to measure the strain structural perturbation for, a, for such a system is, is lowered by effectively a, a ratio that involves the ratio of the coupling uh, constant to the, uh, the, nominal, uh, the nominal spring constant. So, so in all of the previous examples, for instance, the, uh, the, the resonant frequency shift examples you were looking at a change in stiffness, um, and in, if you were to combine that with a more localized readout, 
uh, the potential, again, the thermal mechanical noise flow, if you can get to that resolution, would be lowered by, by, that, by that ratio um, uh, of, of that coupling uh, constant to, the, uh, to the, the normal stiffness of the beam. And that, that, that ratio can actually be quite significant. So that can be uh, practical uh, lim limits are, are of the order of about three to four orders of magnitude. So we realized somewhere between one ten to the three to ten to the four uh, in terms of an improvement in, in relative, uh, sen uh, relative sensitivity. So these, these techniques are just being applied to, to inertial sensing. And there's a recent paper in the Journal of MEMS that describes uh, the implementation of a, of a uh, early generation accelerometer. And this is based on a, on a uh, displacement sensing configuration. So you've got two weekly coupled resonators. And you've got uh, two masses, spring supported masses, um, to give you this uh, differential type effect. Um, so that uh, the gap closes on one of these resonators and uh, it goes in the other direction on the other, other resonator in, a, in, a, in an acceleration field. And uh, you pick up the, uh, the changes in, in stiffness that result due to the, the electrostatic uh, uh, stiffness of, of these resonators that, that changes as a function of gap. So, so these, again, demonstrate the proof of concept for, this, for, these, for these techniques to be applied. Of course, the challenge is then getting down to be able to measure those sorts of thermal mechanical noise limits, uh, which, is, which is where uh, uh, there is uh, there is still ongoing research. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I think those are just edge holes in the device to be able to release mechanically release these devices. Yeah. No. In fact, it. It, yeah, so the these are inertial effects. So the you know, larger the proof mass, um, usually, the, you know, the, the scale would. Okay. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, so, so there are in fact this is a. Uh, so we, we what what I've been describing the model for for this system in the in in here, which is this coupled uh, resonator model. But of course the masses. The, the masses themselves could be considered as, as uh, you know, adding further degrees of freedom to this model if you want, want, wanted to, uh, to model them as well. So those resonant frequencies would be, def be defined separately um, through, through separate con considerations. This is operating very much in a displacement sensing configuration where they're uh, you know, operated in the, uh, you know, below the, the mechanical resonance, well below the mechanical resonance, which is defined by uh, some near DC type measurements. Okay, okay so, so the other class, uh, of course, of uh, inertial sensors where resonant techniques are applied are in the case of vibratory gyroscopes. And in fact, uh, most vibratory gyroscopes rely on some degree of resonant uh, amplification um, to be able to measure uh, rotation rate or whole angle. Um, and a, a whole angle device is, is by its very nature a resonant, uh, resonant device. And there are also advantages in, in resonant output of, of frequency output uh, configurations of, of these gyroscopes that I'll talk about, about here. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, you, uh, the, the, uh, the simplest model for a uh, single axis vibratory rate gyroscope is, is this two degree of freedom mass, mass spring system uh, where one of the modes is your driven mode and the other mode is a sense mode. And in this case, it's a, you've got a Z axis gyro so that the rotation rate is applied about an axis passing through the plane of the, of the board. Then um, you can write out an ex expression for the sense dynamics by this form if you have a uh, essentially an, a constant amplitude, uh, a constant frequency oscillatory dynamics in the drive mode that might be implemented, say, through a, uh, 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 a feedback scheme. So this is uh, the way most rate gyros are modeled. 
uh, you typically ignore the um, um, the, the omega squared terms and the angular acceleration terms, and you just rely on the Coriolis uh, Coriolis term to provide the coupling uh, between uh, the two modes, and um, and in the ranges of rotation that are often of interest, that's that's usually a reasonably good approximation unless you're getting into the very high ac accuracy regimes or the very high dynamic range uh, or high acceleration regimes. Okay, so uh, again, that's an example of how that might be implemented. You've got a mass um, uh, that's driven in a, in a drive mode. Um, this mass may be supported off a, off a, uh, uh, off a uh, frame through these flexures, there might be comb drive actuators that drive that into motion. And then you've got a sense mode defined by these, these other flexures here, uh, where the whole frame displacement, and then you could implement uh, capacitive sensing, for instance. So, so the drive mode described by this, uh, this uh, noise-free oscillator and uh, sense mode um, that uh, uh, whose dynamics is described essentially in the simplest form as a as a resonator subject to the Coriolis uh, forcing uh, that's modulated by the uh, the velocity of the drive. So, so this this uh, of course you can go through the early implementations are usually open loop implementations where you didn't actually close the loop around the sense uh, direction and. Uh, in that case, for an open loop resonator, you can go through the standard uh, uh, force to displacement transfer function to come up with an expression for uh, sense mode displacement as a function of rotation rate. And it's related to this, uh, uh, to the scale factor here. That's a function of the amplitude of the drive mode, uh, A, the amplitude of vibration of the drive mode, and then the frequencies, omega x, of the of the of the uh, drive mode, omega y of the sense mode, and q q sub y the quality factor of the sense mode. And uh, again, there is a fundamental limit detected uh, limit set set by thermomechanical noise, and that that limit's uh, shown here. Um, and uh, again, a function of the different parameters of interest. And this this essentially then gets into um, the optimization of these parameters, because if you wanted to increase the sensitivity, so uh, increase the sense mode displacement for a given rotation rate, you would want to increase the drive mode amplitude. That also lowers the thermomechanical noise floor. Um, you can also think about it as increasing the drive mode velocity, which is, which is perhaps uh, a, a better way to think about that expression. You, you would also want to match the two frequencies and uh, you uh, then get rid of that, that uh, expression there in a mode matched configuration. And in a mode matched configuration, then um, you are, uh, you have in this, in this sort of case, you have a transfer function that is um, two times the drive amplitude multiplied by the quality factor in the sense mode divided by the, the, the resonance frequency in the, uh, in the, of, of the, of the uh, essentially this is just one single resonant frequency now because it's mode match. And it turns out that if you look at the uh, thermomechanical noise floor as well, again, um, the, uh, so, so improving the sensitivity of course would mean improving the quality factor and that, that of course means uh, you also improve the uh, lower the noise noise flow. So these, these are, uh, to some degree, uh, vacuum encapsulated normally, but uh, to allow for high, high bandwidth measurements to the hundreds of hertz, you uh, typically uh, uh, are limited to Q factors that might be on the order of about uh, 100 or so. If you're operating at a frequency of about tens of kilohertz. Um, So that's, those, were, those were the considerations for, for you know, the early generation of open loop uh, gyros. 
as I said, you know, one of, one of these considerations gets into how do you generate large amplitudes. So a lot of the early focus was on uh, electrostatic generators to be able to provide you large drive amplitudes at small applied voltages. And to be able to do that, uh, for example, this is just a case study that runs through a comb drive electrostatic generator <coughs> with, with voltages that can be generated off of uh, CMOS electronics and then looking at the sorts of uh, uh, design requirements you need, say, in terms of quality factor or number of electrodes to, to give you a dry mode displacement of, uh, of a certain value, five microns, that turns out to be fairly large in a MEMS context. Uh, so you t what, what you'll see here, of course, you can trade off with some of these, these, these terms to increase the number of electrodes and lower the Q factor, for instance. Um, and, if, and in fact, some of the damping mechanisms might, might uh, necessarily mean those are, those are connected. Um, uh, but uh, that, is, that is sort of representative of, of the sorts of uh, numbers that come out uh, when, when you want to drive these to large amplitudes. And then you look at uh, some of the considerations on capacitive position measurement. So that displacement in the sense mode being converted to a change in, in capacitance. Um, that is uh, now essentially an accelerometer in that, in that direction. And you, you find that because the Coriolis effect is, is really weak, uh, even for rotation rates on the order of a degree per minute, the sorts of uh, displacements that result, uh, even for a 10% uh, uh, mismatch in, in frequencies, is, is very small. So you, you've got a very significant demand on the uh, capacitance position sensing electronics to be able to resolve these very tiny fractional changes in capacitance. And that was act, in fact what was implemented in the early gyros. So we'll, we'll get into mode matching a little bit later on. Um, and, and, but in most open loop cases, you, you operated in a mode mismatch configuration to allow for, for uh, higher bandwidth measurements. But in fact, uh, most rate gyros uh, are based on, on essentially that, that very principle. Uh, there are a number of ways you can implement this, these, these gyros practically, number of different configurations and uh, associated modes that uh, would, would then correspond to your drive or sense modes. These are just a small fraction. In fact, most of the pattern literature really uh, doesn't, uh, really talks about subtle changes in these, in these topologies to, to get you some uh, potential benefit. Uh, performance. So perhaps one of the first uh, MAMS gyros was this uh, surface micro-machine micro device of the Draper Labs. And this uh, device essentially had electrodes built uh, on top of the substrate for out of plane sensing and a tuning fork uh, configuration. So these, these proof masses were actuated uh, in a tuning fork mode, anti-phase, and then in response to in-plane rotation, uh, you had a, a tilt um, that was detected as a uh, push-pull change in the uh, up and down change in the, in the capacitance, and that, that was what was measured. And this, this uh, turns out, uh, in terms of performance metrics, uh, uh, turned out to be, uh, to be uh, uh, you know, com comparable to some of the best surface micro-machine devices to date. Uh, following on uh, analog devices, uh, uh, probably at, the, at one of the first commercial grade uh, MEMS gyros. Um, so this was back uh, over a decade and a half or so ago. And a paper in the Jones of Salt State Circuits that describes some of the, some of the key uh, parameters here. You can see that uh, even though the, you pulled up the data sheet, the performance wasn't uh, significant. Uh, the, the actual uh, minimum displacement resolutions were very significant here. So you're picking up changes in the order of uh, leptofarads of capacitance and uh, uh, minimum displacements that were on the order of uh, uh, 16 femtometers to, to implement these early uh, open loop MEMS gyros. And that was possible because you had the position measurement uh, electronics embedded, co-located uh, very tightly with the, with the detection. So again, this, this gyro had, uh, in this case, two decoupled masses. Um, 
And this is the Z, Z axis, uh, the Z axis configuration where you have uh, uh, these two masses uh, vibrated uh, anti phase, but not mechanically coupled. They're, they're just electrically driven out of phase. And then in response to a rotation rate of the plane of the page, you had the Coriolis induced acceleration uh, going in opposite direction. So the uh, output uh, here was a differential measurement uh, with a set of capacitive parallel plate electrodes uh, placed on the outside to do that measurement. And because of the, uh, the opposite uh, uh, directions of how the Coriolis acceleration acted ideally 180 degrees out of phase, you could sum up the signals of the capacitive electrodes um, in, a, in a form to give you that differential measure of rotation rate while canceling for common mode effects, uh, uh, for example, common mode acceleration. So that's built in additional immunity to common mode acceleration, for instance. Um, and obviously, there is some immunity with these devices because they operate in the uh, usually typically high kilohertz, high audio frequency range. So uh, that places the uh, the, uh, the output response at, at those, those higher uh, modulated drive frequencies and a locket measurement is possible. So, so uh, that, those were the, uh, so the early devices, both the Vapor Labs device and this, uh, uh, and this other device could be thought of either coupled or decoupled tuning forks, uh, which utilize this differential uh, motion of two masses to give you this immunity to common mode effects uh, like acceleration and temperature. And uh, of course there were further temperature corrections usually with, with a built-in temperature sensor on the, on the CMOS uh, electronics the, or, or by, by CMOS in the early days. And uh, the, the electronics essentially was an implementation of an, of an oscillator in the drive mode in this, in this direction. That's just a feedback oscillator in the drive mode. And then in the sense mode, it was essentially a uh, capacitive uh, position sense um, integrator front end with, and you could do a uh, synchronous demodulation uh, with, with the drive mode uh, signal to, to uh, then extract the, uh, uh, the baseband response. Uh, and uh, that's then your, uh, with, with a low pass filter, then, then a measure of your Coriolis rate, rate response. Of course, uh, there is different levels of calibration built in uh, to account for effects like temperature um, that might be applied in a, in a feed forward sense using the, the PTAT reference. So these early, early devices um, had bias stabilities on the order of about 50 degrees per hour. Um, and since then, uh, the, there has been uh, both evolutions in terms of accuracy, uh, power dissipation uh, by optimizing the, the, uh, the electronics and, uh, and in, in evolution of technology that's allowed for smaller form factor devices. So the M-cubed approach, for instance, is, is an evolution beyond the InventSense approach and InventSense uh, essentially were able to reduce the costs of their devices uh, by using the stack vapor bonding approach to integrate the MEMS on top of the CMOS, um, the sort of probably a generation of the, the M cubed approach, but uh, allowed for uh, now significant scaling in terms of size for these gyros um, and integration of multiple axes of sensing. So, so now, again, this is, this is dated in terms of a chart because now you have uh, you know, full six degree of freedom inertial measurement systems being, being uh, fabricated on, on similar die sizes. Okay, so, um, so, so that is uh, consumer grade gyros. That's the sort of level of modeling that, that's probably sufficient. Now, if we want to look at higher accuracies, we, we need to look at some of the issues in terms of the error sources for these gyros and that they, you know, how they arise both from the mechanics and, and, and the interaction of the electronics. And uh, the starting point for the rate gyro is really to start to capture some of these non-idealities um, in, 
the, uh, in the device through uh, these uh, uh, structural parameters um, in terms of off-axis uh, uh, damping and spring terms. So these essentially represent uh, some form of mechanical, electromechanical coupling between the modes um, that acts in the absence of uh, the rotation rate. So ideally, you just want two, uh, ideally, isotropic oscillators uh, that, that are just coupled by the Coriolis effect, but in, 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 in uh, practice, due to imperfections in fabrication, um, and misalignment of the principal axis of elasticity with the drive and sense directions, you have these, these effects that, that come in, and you've got to account for them in the electronics because it turns out that uh, even though you can, you, you've got very tight control on tolerances using uh, lithography-based processing, these, these, these controls are not sufficient to get you down to the accuracies you need for, for, uh, for gyros. So, so capturing these effects are important, and so some, a model like this, where you capture, for instance, the control forces, the Coriolis effects, the aeroterms, the noise sources, um, in, in, a, in a model that you can run in MATLAB, for instance, and then look at uh, uh, trajectories of the mass uh, subject to these, to perturbations in the system parameters is, 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 is a useful starting point. So in the context of a perfectly um, a mode matched gyro, it turns out that the trajectory is, is essentially a straight line. As you mismatch the, uh, the frequencies, the trajectory uh, turns out to be an ellipse. And there is a decrease uh, in the sense mode response that again is defined by the degree of mismatch in those two, those two directions. There is the significant error term which is, is called quadrature error, which is essentially this error uh, in the off-axis uh, spring terms. And that's captured by the fact that our original models assume the ideal gyroscope assumed that your drive and sense axes were perfectly aligned with the, uh, with the uh, principal axis of elasticity. In practice, that's not. So there is a degree of misalignment, and uh, that can be captured through that uh, cross-coupling effect. But any internal mechanical coupling, or in fact, indeed, any, any unwanted coupling that, that uh, would, would result in that sort of uh, cross-axis cross, cross -axis, uh, response results in a disruption of the trajectory from a straight line to, uh, to, to an uh, elliptical trajectory in the absence of, uh, with, so this is in the, in the case of uh, a Coriolis uh, term, and this is in the absence of any, any, any Coriolis force. And you see, essentially, what, what you have here is, even in the absence of any rotation rate, a coupling causes the, the motion to that, uh, to that sense mode because of that, uh, because of that effect. So that, that's got to be accounted for, and there are a number of levels in which you can account for those effects um, uh, through an initial calibration and typically through, through a feedback compensation approach through uh, electrostatic uh, stiffness-based tuning, uh, because these, these are typically uh, much smaller terms as compared to the principal, the magnitude of those principal stiffnesses. The, uh, the other issue, of course, is uh, this issue of mode matching uh, that we just looked at. So to, to increase the sensitivity in this very simplistic sense, you would want to match the modes but then you run into an issue of uh, the trade-off between sensitivity and bandwidth. So let's take the case where you've got a mode mismatch between the drive and sense mode and their, their responses are described by these two response curves shown here. And if you've got this drive mode oscillator that's being driven at resonance, then the sense mode amplitude would be much smaller than if, if the two frequencies were perfectly matched. Uh, the problem is if you were to match the frequencies more closely, of course you would get an improvement in sensitivity, but if you have a rotation rate that is not constant but time varying, uh, that would mean that uh, that sense mode amplitude would vary as a function of the, uh, of how the rotation rate varies as well, which means that you've got a scale factor that's a function of time as well uh, in an open loop context. And therefore that, that 
is where the basis between the trade-off between uh, sensitivity and bandwidth arises from. That's one of the reasons why the early open loop configurations for MEMS gyros had operation off uh, the mode match case so that you could essentially uh, trade off sensitivity for bandwidth because you still have, uh, for let's say a sinusoidally varying rotation rate, you would see side bands appear at these, uh, uh, at, at these, uh, at frequency spacings defined by the, the frequency uh, of variation of the rotation rate, and um, for for a sub, sub for reasonable mismatch, you, you still have reasonable scale factor linearity preserved. Of course, this is not the case, as you can imagine, if you're perfectly mode matched, in which case the scale factor linearity would be significantly decreased if you go, if, if, if this uh, omega sub A term would be much larger than the half hour bandwidth of the, of the device, for instance. And again, this is one of the reasons why the early devices were not, uh, were, were hermetically packaged, but not uh, vacuum sealed at very low pressure levels because you wanted uh, uh, mechanical bandwidth and response time uh, uh, for, for audio frequency uh, uh, resonators. So, so that's, uh, the sensitivity bandwidth trade-off. Of course, the other issues is, is to do with the robustness of the scale factor with uh, parameters like temperature. So for instance, both the resonant frequency of the drive and sense mode, if they were not compensated, uh, would drift with effects like temperature, and that of, of course would change the frequency spacing, and in turn, uh, you have a change in scale factor with frequency spacing. So, uh, this can be captured by an amplitude error plot that plots uh, the, the delta in the drive and sense modes as a function of the amplitude error for the same rotation rate. So if you've got, um, uh, you know, for instance, a mode mismatch uh, that starts out, so this is, this is sorry, the, the mode mismatch between the two modes as a function of the, uh, the variation in the, in the frequencies for two different uh, cases. And if you've got a, uh, of course, a, uh, a case where your, your modes are perfectly matched, of course, that's the, the case where you would be most sensitive to variations, uh, because even small variations would throw you off the, of the uh, peak response in, in, a, uh, in an open loop configuration. So that's, that's another reason why the, the early devices were biased off uh, the mode match configuration typically around 10% uh, from of the center frequency to allow for robustness to both uh, variations in those in those resonant frequencies as well as uh, increase, increasing the bandwidth of the device. But of course, uh, you could uh, build in immunity to these variations by looking at uh, approaches where you have a broader bandwidth response to the sense mode. So you trade off bandwidth of sensitivity by implementing a, essentially a mechanical bandpass filter for the sense mode response. So if you add an additional degree of freedom um, for the sense mode, you can, you can come up with these, uh, uh, just as in for, for uh, uh, resonator filters, it's the same sort of idea here, but uh, essentially just shaping the response of the sense mode and if you've got the drive mode then positioned in the middle of this valley, uh, changes in, in the uh, frequency of the drive mode or leads any uh, modulations of the signal uh, about the drive mode uh, impact far less on the, on the scale factor of the device. So this is an example of an implementation of, of, of such a device uh, in a MEMS context. Uh, there are variations to both pressure and temperature recorded, and as you can see, there is significant variations in the, in the measured response peaks of the, of the modes, um, both in the absent amplitudes and then some shift in frequency. But uh, because you can um, position the drive mode peak in between, uh, and this, this response uh, in the valley is, is uh, relatively immune to these, these effects, you have the response curves essentially lining up 
uh, you know, at, at temperatures at 25 and 75 degrees centigrade. So there is a, again, because of this mechanical bandpass construction, you have a degree of passive immunity built into temperature variations, while in a conventional gyroscope, which didn't have this additional degree of freedom added in, would demonstrate a response curve, which is quite different at, at that higher temperature. Um, so it would need additional correction, uh, say using a temperature sensor, for instance. So, so again, for the implementation of this device showing uh, variations over a fairly much wider range again, and uh, uh, this built-in uh, passive robustness to, to temperature. Okay, so this, this idea of uh, now uh, adding in additional degrees of freedom to provide some degree of mechanical robustness to temperature variations, cancellation of common mode effects like acceleration, or coming up with dynamically balanced configurations can taken they can be, be taken forward in this this implementation from from um, group at UC Irvine. They have built what is called a quad mass gyro. Um, so um, this configuration allows for a number of in interesting features uh, where you can cancel off common mode effects, reduce losses to the, the substrate and anchoring um, that might otherwise arise and uh, provide some immunity to, to, to effects like temperature, for instance. So the, the way the, 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 uh, the, the gyro operates is, is in these two uh, key modes. So there are, essentially you can think of this as coupled uh, tuning forks um, and these, these tuning forks are constrained by these lever arms that run uh, between them, and uh, in in both cases, you've got a sort of a push-pull uh, uh, tuning fork type configuration, uh, so that the effects of rotation rate on on these on on these two systems would be equal and opposite, um, assuming all of the other parameters are the same. So, so these these configurations uh, then operated it can be operated in a mode. Uh, matched setting in a rate configuration with with force feedback. In such a configuration, you would uh, you you can go back to that equation that I that, that we had a few slides ago. Um, if the the modes are matched, the the scale factor then turns out to <coughs> be simply two times the drive amplitude divided by the ratio of the uh, of Q divided by omega. Um, so again, if you if you wanted uh, increased sensitivity, there, there are some very clear uh, uh, variations in how you would change these parameters as long as you can account for for the response through through uh, uh, through closed loop control. The uh, evolution of the of the trajectories in a mode match sense in a rate mode is essentially the uh, turns out to be a precession of a, of a straight line. Um, and in a case where you're, say, preserving the amplitude of, a, of, the, of the motion in a drive mode, you would find increasing um, energy then being coupled into that sense mode through that, through that uh, sort of configuration. Uh, so these, these devices, because of the ability to mode match, uh, you know, the early devices had uh, had improved bias stabilities compared to some of the other approaches that I've, I've talked about. And uh, in a rate mode, um, uh, some of the best angle random walk uh, measurements uh, that have been reported in the literature. But these devices could also, can also be operated in another mode, a whole angle mode of operation. And uh, in this case, um, Essentially, uh, what um, you do is to allow for um, the, uh, the system to operate in a energy conserving state. So this is, the analogy is that to, um, to so-called spendulum and uh, the way that operates. Um, so essentially what you're building is, a, is an isotropic uh, two degree of freedom oscillator 
and uh, just looking at the precession of the uh, vibration pattern uh, over time. And in fact, that precession occurs at a rate that's defined by the rotation rate um, in the, uh, the non-inertial frame. And so that, that then is measured uh, simply by measuring the ratio of amplitudes in the uh, sense mode to the drive mode. Um, um, and, and that ratio of amplitudes is a measure of the, of the, uh, of the angle. So in fact, uh, because this, this device is, incorporates rate integrating features, um, the integration with respect to time, which is one of the sources of error for gyros, um, it doesn't have to be done within the electronics, it's, it's built into the device uh, dynamics itself. So I've attached a few slides to talk, that talk through the uh, uh, derivation of the, uh, the key equation to describe the dynamics of this, this uh, angle gyro, but essentially, as I said, it uh, is, um, it, it, it's, it's the dynamics of essentially two isotropic oscillators um, as viewed from an inertial frame um, and measured in, a, in that non-inertial rotating frame of reference. Um, and uh, if you look, end up looking at the, the amplitude of the drive and, uh, and sense modes in that uh, rotating reference frame, uh, the, uh, uh, the precession angle is defined in the, uh, in the modulation of the amplitudes of those, of those, uh, uh, of, of the responses in the, in those two axes. So really, uh, the simplest way of uh, doing an angle measurement would then, then just be uh, uh, measuring the, uh, the ratio of those, those two displacements. Okay, so in practice, there is a little bit more detail in, in how the electronics is implemented because you've got to deal with imperfections, structural imperfections, and noise sources in the electronics. Um, and uh, so this is one of the implementations that was, was built on one of those quad mass gyros. Um, and uh, again, uh, one, one of the uh, desirable features for a angle mode gyros is the, uh, is the fact that you have low damping conditions established in these devices. So, so there is, uh, of course, the, the fact that uh, you, you, you have to, uh, you, you can vacuum encapsulate these devices uh, to, to reduce fluid, uh, eliminate fluid damping. Uh, you've got this dynamically balanced tuning fork configuration to try and minimize structural damping and then, uh, and losses to the, to the substrate. And then uh, you minimize thermoelastic damping. Uh, uh, again, uh, to the extent you can by um, the uh, configuration of the, uh, the suspension flexures and, and uh, the operating frequencies. So these Q factors for the drive and sense mode in these cases were on the order of over a million. And uh, the ring down times um, are on the order of uh, several hundreds of seconds uh, in, these, in these sort of early implementations. So again, you can mode match these two modes using electrostatic spring tuning effects. So this is uh, a case where you've got near mode match configuration um, for those, uh, for that quad mass gyro, and then operated in that whole angle uh, mode of operation uh, where you uh, uh, have a direct measurement of angle. And uh, the, the contrast with respect to uh, measurements within the same device of rotation rate then, then, then integrated within, within the electronics is, is quite considerable in terms of the deviations uh, in, uh, in, in uh, the estimation of angle as a function of time. Um, so more recently, there's, there's uh, some work that's been reported at the IEEE Inertial Systems Conference uh, just a few months ago. 
which is starting to take these, these gyros um, down to the limits where uh, uh, the bias stabilities are on the order of uh, less than 0.1 degree per hour uh, at, these, at these large integration times. And uh, projected models uh, with, with Q factors that, that have been otherwise measured seem to indicate that navigation grade performance might be possible with, with these sorts of implementations. <coughs> so when you, when you start to build highly accurate gyros, you can start to use them for, for, for uh, applications like determining true north. Um, so we are all standing on a, on a rotating reference frame uh, that's, that's spinning at about 15 degrees per hour or so. Um, and you can measure this using a highly accurate gyro if its, uh, if it's sensitive axis is, is pointing in the right direction. So uh, again, those quad mass gyros uh, can uh, start to, to pick up uh, or, or gyros of that sort of uh, uh, grade can start to pick up those, those sorts of uh, uh, variations. Uh, and uh, what this, this allows one to do is together with a highly accurate gravity sensor, you can then uh, use an inertial platform to uh, define true north and, uh, and your position in, in, uh, in, 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 uh, with, with respect to, uh, uh, to a, uh, uh, to, to a, uh, uh, fixed reference frame. So you've got uh, here uh, these, these early uh, devices actually reported in IEEE MEMS now about four or five years ago had, a, had an error, not finding error of, of around 100 milliradian, a little over 100 milliradian or so. Um, and this, this uh, thing has now been improved to, uh, with calibration techniques, uh, where, you, where you might uh, have these mounted on a, on a calibration platform that, uh, uh, or a dithering stage, you could, you could then improve these uh, uh, further, uh, uh, you know, down, down to about a milliradian or so. So that then allows you to do what's called gyro comp composite, uh, that using, using these, these uh, mechanical gyros as a compass. Okay, so, uh, that talked about two of the grades of these of these gyros, rate and angle for rate and angle measurements. There is another class where, which is actually related closely to the theme of the conference, that's based on uh, frequency output readout. And uh, so, for example, this is a surface micromachine implementation um, that involves a proof mass that's coupled to uh, to uh, vibrating beam elements whose uh, frequencies are modulated uh, in a push-pull configuration by the Coriolis force. So again, this is a force measurement technique just as an, for an accelerometer that applied to the measurement of the, the Coriolis force. It turns out that one of the benefits of these, these frequency uh, techniques, so here you have a frequency modulated output that uh, is a, uh, essentially a uh, output of, of these of the frequency of these tuning forks that's, that's uh, changing as a function of the, uh, of the drive frequency. Um, and uh, it turns out that that uh, scale factor is a dimensionless quantity. So um, the ratio uh, of the output to the input is essentially a term that, that, that's dimensionless. And it turns out that there is a passive uh, immunity, therefore, to effects like temperature because, for instance, if these are all constructed out of the same material, then the frequencies of the, of the proof mass uh, resonator uh, drift the temperature uh, nearly identical to those, to those uh, of the resonators as defined by the material properties. And so that allows for considerable uh, passive immunity to, to temperature effects. Um, with, with these sorts of devices. Um, now, in the literature, there is 
uh, been recent work on what are called frequency modulated gyroscopes, uh, frequency output gyroscopes uh, that operate in a slightly different uh, configuration. So these are, again, could be implemented in any of those classical topologies that we talked about. So essentially uh, uh, mode matched uh, isotropic oscillators um, or uh, with, with, uh, with minor mode mismatch uh, in, the, in the presence of a rotation rate, in fact, uh, can be shown that the, uh, the eigenvalues for the system or the, uh, uh, the natural frequencies are now split by the uh, input rotation. And by measuring this variation in the, in the uh, eigenfrequencies of the system, you can measure the, the rotation rate directly. So in this case, you would have two uh, feedback loops, two oscillators, um, and these are coupled just by the Coriolis effect, ideally. So the dynamics, again, uh, goes back to the same set of equations that we used to describe the angle gyro, uh, and you can show that the eigenvalues for this for the system can be written in a, ge in a general sense when you've got a slight uh, mode split uh, in this form. It turns out that this, this of course, this general uh, case is, is the nonlinear function of the uh, rotation rate, but then under mode matched conditions, um, or near mode matched conditions, you can linearize this, this uh, expression, and you can then express the rotation rate simply as a function of the output frequencies of these two oscillators. So again, uh, the me measurement that uh, would take up those, would, could be applied uh, uh, then uh, using techniques that are very familiar to, to this community. This is, a, this is essentially showing you the fact that in fact the mode matched configuration is the ideal case in terms of sensitivity for such types of devices. So if you have a uh, mode match configuration, then your scale factor is linear and you've got the greatest sensitivity to rotation rate, uh, but in the mode mismatch configuration, uh, you have uh, a, uh, uh, unless you, you, you're at very high angular uh, high rotation rates, you, uh, so rotation rates that are comparable to the resonant frequency of the devices, you don't see significant uh, sensitivity. So in fact, uh, uh, these, these are prefer preferentially operated in a mode match configuration. So this, these are uh, some results that have been reported recently on these frequency modulated gyros and uh, with the two servo loops that have been built in and then measurements of the changes in frequency. And you can see as, as uh, the rotation rates are increased, you see a, a uh, frequency splitting that, that occurs and that's measured. And again, with these frequency output gyros, there is a natural immunity to temperature effects um, uh, because the scale factor here is independent of uh, temperature, so these, these response curves line up. Um, and some of the highest scale factor, highest stability scale factor gyros are in fact these uh, that are inherently stable, are these uh, mode match frequency modulated gyroscopes. Okay, so that those are the three classes of gyros. Uh, wanted to touch upon a few of the other types uh, of uh, gyros that, that fall into one of these, these categories, but are looking at uh, adding additional features uh, that are not described before. So one of these has to do with uh, the operation of, uh, of these gyros in a bulk acoustic mode. So axisymmetric structures such as discs, rings or toroidal geometries and things of that sort are um, ideal for uh, gyros because you have a, uh, uh, you know, your, your ideal uh, conditions are essentially to, to create isotropic oscillators and these, these sorts of, of structures have uh, built-in uh, symmetry to the structural configuration that uh, results in the presence of degenerate modes that are in the absence of any, any perturbations uh, mode matched, inherently mode matched. 
So, uh, for example, in discs, you have these uh, elliptical uh, sort of, uh, wine glass mode like uh, uh, bulk acoustic waves that uh, you can generate where you uh, can operate at uh, much higher frequencies. These are associated much higher stiffness uh, stiffnesses uh, with, with the bulk modes um, and uh, have this natural degeneracy built in. Uh, there is, of course, an isotropy of material properties associated with single crystal silicon, but it turns out that uh, the higher order uh, modes um, are matched with the with the, uh, the variation in the material uh, properties quite nicely. So you have uh, uh, you have uh, degeneracy even in single crystal silicon for some of those some of the higher order elliptical modes. Uh, beyond uh, the, the first order, uh, so uh, so these these sorts of uh, devices uh, could potentially also have the benefits of very high Q factors, um, the Q factors that might be well over over a million or so, and the, the high stiffnesses allow for robustness to um, to environmental vibrations, for instance, so that then the audio frequency configurations of most of the previous gyros that were operating in the low kilohertz to uh, a few tens of kilohertz are, uh, uh, are probably more sensitive, of course, to environmental effects like common mode acceleration than, than some of these, these devices that are much stiffer. So, so in this case, again, this is also on, uh, on, uh, on these gyros uh, showing more matched capability for these for these devices um, in in uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in single crystal silicon. Some of the other uh, another example of high performance gyroscope is this device from Boeing um, uh, that involved a suspension scheme um, with uh, sort of this concentric ring geometry that uh, tries to uh, provide. Uh, uh, Structural symmetry, so this, this uh, isotropy in these in the in, in a two-dimensional plane um, of the of this of the suspension scheme, and again there are two degenerate modes as a result, and uh, uh, in a, in a you can either operate these in, in a rate mode or a whole angle mode, and uh, these results are reported in. Um, in uh, at the IEEE plans conference, um, demonstrate uh, performance that is now sort of touching uh, navigation grade when when calibrated and, and compensated. So again, these these also could be used as uh, not seeking gyros that uh, um, were fairly good performance in terms of. Uh, 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 measurement of true north. Okay, so so that that is uh, so some examples um, showing that there is now evolution in, in performance on on the various metrics of in, of interest. To start and address some of those applications that I was talking about. I'm going to skip over some of these slides because I, we've just got a couple of minutes to go. Uh, but you've got some additional slides on your uh, on your handouts that will talk about some of some of the other interesting directions uh, that are being looked at uh, in terms of assembly of uh, of inertial measurement units and also creating these these structures say out of material like fused silica, uh, which inherently is lower thermoelastic damping than than single crystal silicon. Uh, but also trying to create structures that, that capture um, structural symmetry um, uh, in uh, well, potentially more than one axis. So, um, so, so with, with a lot of what you've seen, in fact, resonant techniques are fundamental to getting uh, resonant techniques of transduction of these inertial forces, uh, which, are fun, uh, which are inherent in a mode match configuration for a gyro or in, um, in a resonant accelerometer 
and you, you, you have associated uh, higher bias stabilities are in fact in, in, inherent to uh, uh, these improvements in performance. And, and in fact, uh, applications like pedestrian navigation that have been talked about for ages are now uh, starting to get accessible. The initial sorts of uh, cases will involve probably consumer grade gyros uh, with uh, significant uh, calibration and noise filtering, uh, and then maybe uh, uh, using some other modalities of sensing. So suddenly uh, you've got uh, access to magnetic field and, and uh, altimeters that might be used to uh, aid with some of the, the position estimation algorithms. But a lot of the specifications for, for the gyros you've seen are starting to get to a point where you could use these inertial sensors for, for navigation, navigation at least over short distances. Uh, we're talking uh, uh, potentially uh, several tens of minutes to um, also, um, uh, and that, that would be very significant in terms of being able to update with, uh, with GPS, for instance. Uh, and that, that lowers power dissipation as well. So another application, I think, for the high, very high performance uh, tilt sensors. So we want to look at stabilities over long periods of time. So this is work that we are very involved in, in collaboration with civil and geotechnical groups that are looking at uh, monitoring tilt in tunnel linings. So this is a London Underground. Where in fact, MEMS accelerometers are being deployed to measure tiny variations in tilt in the lining over time. And here you need very high stability measurements over time. In fact, uh, uh, some of the approaches that we've been looking at in resonant uh, accelerometers could be, could be beneficial. But there are lots of other approaches for high stability tilt sensors uh, that, that uh, could, be, could be enabled with, with, uh, with resonant sensing. So another application that we're involved with is, is an application in volatile gravity. So some of the uh, techniques would allow you to uh, start to measure near DC measurements down to uh, levels that are about close to one part in 10 to the eight, to one part in 10 to the nine of Earth's gravitational field. And what that then allows you to do is by um, correlating across either multiple sensors or um, sensor uh, readings as a function of location into a borehole, estimate uh, the density of formation around, around, a, around a monitoring well. And so this is of interest in applications uh, such as oil and gas monitoring, where you're looking at say, monitoring large bodies of fluid moving around in the subsurface. So that's, that's it. Uh, so there's, there's a number of very interesting applications that are now being enabled by MEMS inertial sensors. In this two hour uh, slot, there's probably very little time for me to cover uh, all of these, this, this full breadth of this field. So really, I hope this has given you a start to some of the uh, interesting uh, uh, sort of uh, developments, particularly in the application of resonant techniques to the measurement of inertial forces. There's a lot more detail in all of the references, obviously, that I've uh, attached here. So I advise uh, you to, uh, if you're interested, uh, want to, to look in uh, further, maybe look into some of these other uh, references, uh, which also touch upon a lot, of, lot more detail, some of the work that, uh, that I've described, uh, described here. So, uh, yeah, with that, uh, yeah, happy to take any questions. Okay. Yeah, it's a good question. So, so gyro bias errors, you know, have sort of been traditionally the biggest source uh, for uh, achieving navigation grade performance. And uh, as, as you've seen, there's been considerable improvement there uh, since, uh, and certainly there are uh, sort of research prototypes that uh, would, would approach 
you know, uh, a stone's throw across navigation grade performance for a gyro, or at least allow you to start looking at uh, things like you know, GPS backup um, type applications. Um, the, but with accelerometers, certainly a lot of the consumer grade accelerometers obviously are sufficient in terms of navigation performance. So it's not, those are not probably the, the driving application for, for accelerometers. Uh, but there are other applications. So for example, the, the application that I talked about in terms of tilt sensing, for instance, where you need long stabilities over time, or gravity sensing, uh, where again, you, or seismic imaging would be cases where you do need very high resolution uh, or very high accuracy or high stability over time. And those are the directions where, um, where resonant techniques, in fact, uh, scale well. Um, so, you know, there, there are, it, it's, it, I, I put up the, the case of the inertial measurement system really to sort of show how a system level requirement then percolates down to device metrics. Um, but of course, each application is very different and you would, you would uh, have to do, you know, do that sort of analysis for each, each of these applications, uh, which then defines what, what, what the metric of interest would be. Okay then, I think we are probably all looking forward to lunch, so happy to take any questions. Obviously, I'm not at the conference for the next, um, for the whole duration, so I'd be happy to have a chat anytime if you have any questions. Okay, thanks very much.